Hey, thanks so much for tuning into our YouTube channel. Whether you're new here or whether you visit here frequently, we just want to say thanks so much for tuning in. Would you consider giving us a subscription or a like or a comment? Again, thanks so much for tuning in to Victory City's YouTube channel. Good morning, good morning. Come on, so good. What a beautiful worship. You can take your seats this morning. Thank you, Pastor Eric. Don't you love your pastors, Pastor Eric and Natalie? They're incredible. Great church here in Austin. I am a Tigers fan, and uh, my parents are Cajun. I am not, like I am Cajun, but like Cajuns, like I'm not from Louisiana Cajun. I was born and raised in Seattle, and like a West Coast Cajun. All right, like I dress it up nice. It's like a you know, my dad has 110 first cousins. For real, I'm not lying. 110. So I married a Mexican to make sure I didn't marry my cousin. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Viva la Mexico, let's go! Ay! So, yeah, beautiful wife, three kids at home. Straight up, dude, I'm not being, you gotta be sure about these things, you know? <laughs> I'm pumped to be here, the Tigers won, and uh, God is good. And so, uh, we're gonna go to the book of Revelation. Pastor Eric told me we're a Bible church, and uh, we're a Bible-believing church, and I was like, what? Well, great, why don't we go to the book of Revelation? <laughs> The book that makes everyone uncomfy. It's like Leviticus and Revelation. It's like, oh, you know. So we're going to do that today. Is that cool? We're going to go to the book of Revelation. We're going to go to chapter 5, verse 5. And uh, the title of what I want to talk about today is Standing with the Lamb. If I had it my way, I would have titled this sermon, Jesus' Guide to Survive the Apocalypse. It's kind of more fun, isn't it? So we'll go with that. Jesus' Guide to Survive the Apocalypse. It's going to be fun. Um, and the key is buy more toilet paper. That's the key. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's a joke. Okay, Revelation 5, verse 5. Here we go. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb. Can you say a lamb? A lamb. Standing as though it had been slain. With seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll uh, from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowl of, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Uh, what the heck is happening? Did this lamb fall into a, cos you know, a, a, a nuclear waste plant, seven eyes, seven horns? Like, what the? All these beasts and elders, everyone, what, what? Revelation is a, such an interesting book, isn't it? I grew up as a pastor's kid in a very charismatic church. So for Halloween, we watched Left Behind. <laughs> okay, like dressed up like Bible man, Okay. Like, dude, this is not cool, mom, right? It's like, if you don't get right, you're going to be left behind, right? <laughs> My mom would always say, like, don't be lukewarm, you know? Either be hot or cold or spew you out. I'm like, I'll be cold then. I'm, I'm ice cold, <laughs> right? That's not what that verse is saying, but it's so funny. This, so, so this is the, the reaction to the book of Revelation. Either we grew up that way and our focus is so much so on the geopolitical climate of the day. And we make the book of Revelation an equation to try to make sense of our world and our cultures. And we're consistently trying to find who's the Antichrist. And it's usually the person that doesn't politically agree with you. <laughs> Whatever side you land on. Right? Or, or, or what's the mark of the beast? And what is this? And what is that? And we're trying to determine who, what, when, why, how based on what we see that's going on in the world. So we take what we see, and then we allow that to interpret what we hear. Or we just avoid the book altogether. And like my wife, she's like, he's going to return. I don't need to know how. <laughs> and so our Bible ends in 3 John, because Jude's kind of scary too. It's like, I just want to know that I'm loved. Like, I don't want to hear about apostasy and the apocalypse. I'm good, right? So we, we kind of stop. We, don't, we avoid it. It's like, you know, Voldemort, he who shall not be named, the book of Revelation. I know, Harry Potter, I'm sorry. Forgive me, forgive me. I don't endorse it. I've never seen it. 
It's horrible. Demonic, okay? I forget I'm in Texas. In California, you're like, oh, that's great, you know? <laughs> We're working on them. We're in Babylon, okay? Come on. <laughs> so we avoid it at all costs, but what we miss is this. We miss a beautiful book about worship. That's what Revelation is. It's a narrative about worship, and it's a beautiful narrative, and it's a narrative about the battle for your worship, and that we have to understand a cosmic battle, a supernatural battle is happening right now, whether we realize it or not, and the book of Revelation does not give us any space or place to be neutral. It's either we are worshiping God or we are worshiping the beast. Either we are settled with the kingdom in heaven or we are unsettled in the kingdoms of this world. But there is a cosmic battle and the battle is for our worship. And the book of Revelation gets a bad rap because it's actually a cool book. Yes, John uses imagery and numbers and symbols, but he's speaking prophetically to the church of all time. This is how you are going to have to fight, and this is what you are fighting for. And he starts off the book, and it's awesome. Revelation 1.1, he says it's the revelation of the Antichrist. No. He says it's the revelation of the mark of the beast. No. What does he say in Revelation 1.1? It is the revelation of... Jesus Christ, we spend more time trying to figure out who our enemy is that we don't read a book that's showing us the person who already overcame the enemy. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not two-dimensional. He's not three-dimensional. He's not even seven-dimensional. He is eternally dimensional. And he gave us a book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, to show us the multifaceted layers of his personality, of his character, and who he is. To show us that, hey, you can do it because I did it. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word apocalypse means simply this. It means to uncover or to reveal. It doesn't mean buy more toilet paper. It means to uncover or to reveal. And what or who is it revealing? Jesus. The eschaton or eschatology, the end of all things, is just simply the final and full revelation that Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's going to reestablish a new heavens and a new earth where we as the saints will live with him forever and worship him forever. It's a revealing of Jesus. It's a revelation. It's a divine revelation and it's a divine story about the mercy of God, about the grace of God. But it is not without conflict because what story is good without conflict? There's a conflict going on. So how do we navigate the conflict as we wait for the final revelation of Christ? That's the book of Revelation. What do we do? How do we respond? So John loves to use imagery to describe Jesus as bringing different revelations about Jesus. And the number one imagery he uses to describe the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who came from heaven to earth and died on a cross, was resurrected and ascended into heaven. The number one way, the number one symbol is that of a lamb. Super interesting. California, if I bring up like a ranch, he's like, hey, you know what a lamb is? They're like, No. But if I'm going to talk about a lamb here, a lamb is not intimidating. It's not aggressive. It's dependent upon. It's humble. It's lowly. Yet this is 28 times the image that's used of Christ. 28 times. Pastor Eric just brilliantly led us into a space where we are worshiping not the worship leaders, not the song, but we are priests. And where do we get this from? Well, in Revelation chapter 5, we just finished chapters 2 through 3 where he's giving a, a correction to seven churches except for two. And the only two that didn't get a correction were those. He's like, you guys are suffering enough. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. They're like, okay, thanks, man. <laughs> 
And he finishes every single one. He says, let, he who has an ear to hear, let him, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And then he says, oh, and a door opened into heaven. And he goes into heaven and he sees a heavenly worship service. Chapter 4, they're worshiping the one on the throne. And worthy is the holy, holy, holy. Worthy, where all your worship songs are coming from Revelation. Revelation 5, is says, who, who, who's, who's worthy to open the scroll? John is weeping. No one is worthy to open the scroll. And then they say, behold. The lion from the tribe of Judah. And he hears that, and what is he thinking he's going to see? I told my son that in Texas you can have a cheetah, because he loves cheetahs. He's like, can we have a pet cheetah? I'm like, not in California. But if you move to Texas and you buy a ranch, they're not gonna t- they won't tell you what to do with your land. You want a cheetah? Get a cheetah. So he's been, every time I call him, he's like, have you seen a cheetah yet? I'm like, it's not like that. <laughs> But what are you thinking? You're thinking a lion. It's going to be ferocious. It's going to attack. It's a predator. So he hears a lion of the tribe of Judah. And what does he look up and he sees? It's a lamb that was slain. Standing as if, but though it was slain. He's standing, but he was slain. This is wordplay to show you how you stand. How do we stand for our worship? We have to follow in the way of the lamb. To be slain. To lay down our life. It's the opposite of how the kingdoms of this world conquered. That's what the line of the tribe of Judah is. It's a conquering. How do they, it's the laying out of God's kingdom. It's the fulfillment of God's kingdom. But God doesn't conquer the way we conquer. God doesn't expand his kingdom the way that we do. He does it by becoming a lamb and laying down his life. And he's now laid out a pathway for us. So what do we do with this? Christ is worthy and he conquers because he does it in a completely different way. The lamb that was slain. There are two keys to understand this and we're going to, how do we stand with the lamb? There's two keys we're going to focus on today. Number one, it is the method that we have and that we need that will help us interpret what God is, what's happening in the world while we wait. We need a good method. We need a good method. So so God's method is this. What we hear will reinterpret what we see. All seven churches got that. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. How many of you have kids and know that there's a difference between listening and hearing? Right? My two-year-old, a beautiful angel, also a demonic tyrant at times bites and scratches and at nighttime it's like where are you going bro you get time for bed he's like no I'm like do you hear me no I know you hear me you hear me yeah why what is hearing when we say do you hear me are you going to obey the same is for John it's not did you listen to the spirit it's did you obey the spirit God's method is not what you see interprets what you hear God's method is what you hear interprets what you see We need to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. We have to have a method. And for my Pentecostals and Charismatics, yes, saying the Spirit told me so is a method. Pentecostals like, I don't have a method. The Spirit just leads me. No, that's a method. Whatever I think this verse means, it's what it means because the Spirit told me that's a method. We have to have the method of heaven. And so we have to understand that God has a method. What we hear will reinterpret What we see and to hear is to listen and obey. The second thing we have to to do in order to overcome and stand with the Lamb is we have to understand the thing that will stop us as believers is not the obvious evils of this world. It's not. It's not the wars and the rumors of wars. It's not the things that we can look at and say there's something obviously wrong. The thing that will stop the believer is the deceitful schemes of the enemy that seem like they're good. That is what will stop us. That's why when Jesus says, I have to cut these days short for the sake of the elect, he's not just talking about persecution, which is going to happen and is happening around the world. He's speaking of the things that are subtle and deceiving that present themselves as if they are good, but they're really not God. So we're going to explore those two ideas today. Is that okay? We're going to go to Revelation 13 verse 11. Revelation 13, 
verse 11. John says this, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Hmm. So another beast rising out had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. The only time the lamb is used in Revelation not describing Jesus is here in chapter 13. And it's, it's interesting, the placement, because in the middle of, you know, we, we get to chapter 11, and it seems like we are racing, like they're going to do today, F1 racing. We are speeding towards the end. We are driving full force straight to the return of Christ, and it's the seventh seal is open. We're like, let's go. Jesus is coming back. And what does John do? Pause. Let me tell you another story. Guys, you know that's a literary device John used because he's actually a genius? Which is crazy. We always like the disciples. <laughs> They're so dumb. It's like, no, they were so smart. So he pauses and he says, let me tell you another story. Why? Because that's how it feels about the return of Jesus. It's like, it's going to happen right now. It's happening. And then it doesn't. It's called the already and the not yet. There's this tension of we've already received victory, yet there's the final victory. We've already received the spirit, yet we will live in eternity with him. What, there's this tension of the already and the not yet. So John pauses on the pursuit of the eschaton, and he says, let me tell you about the supernatural battle that's happening right now for your worship. And he introduces some crazy characters. Chapter 12, we see this pregnant lady. Come on, pregnant ladies, let me get a shout out. Woo -woo! Right? She's pregnant with a child and she gives birth. And the dragon tries to sweep him up, but she, the dragon can't. The baby is brought, the man child, it says, is brought up into heaven. And what happens when he's brought into heaven, a war breaks out. Michael and the angels are battling these demonic angels, and the, the accuser of the brethren is cast down. And then it says the woman had more offspring. And because the dragon couldn't get the man-child, now the dragon starts to attack the offspring. That's the church. Come on. Come on. The man-child is Jesus, not us. It's like, I ascended into heaven. He couldn't get me. No. There was a victory that was won on earth. And he's cast down. And this battle begins to happen. And then we see two more crazy figures. So then the dragon, from the dragon comes forth the first beast. And it's got ten heads. The heck are we talking about, John? Ten heads. And it received a mortal wound. Why? Because there was a victory that was won. Yet, it has a parody resurrection. A counterfeit resurrection. Oh, you thought your God won. He didn't win. I'm still here. That's what the first beast does. The first beast is mocking Christ and his victory. Then we see the second beast. And the second beast has a job. And he's good at his job. Because this is the idea. He wants to present himself as a lamb. Because he wants to get the inhabitants of the earth to worship the first beast. He wants your worship. And he wants you to worship someone that's mocking God. Mocking the power, the authority of the kingdom. But he does it in such a way that it kind of makes you feel good. It makes you feel safe. He lowers your discernment because you're looking at it. It's like, it's just a lamb. It's not it's not going to harm me. It's not going to hurt me. But if we're not careful, we may be adopting the methodology of the earth. And we may be listening and standing with the wrong lamb because we've used the wrong method. The human method is this. What I see interprets what I hear. That's the human method. The atheistic view is I'll believe it when I see it. Believers have adopted that. Yeah, I'll believe that Jesus is in all control when I see him return. I'll believe it when I see it. How about on the other side? We start looking at everything that's happening in the world and who's fighting who and what's happening and what candidate's running. And then we look at Revelation and we say, okay, this is what I saw. Now, how does that fit what I hear? 
And we put what we see as the layer to interpret what we hear, not what we hear to reinterpret what we are seeing. What about Daniel? King Nebuchadnezzar, what did he see? A statue of glorious metals. And he's like, that's pretty good. And he loved it so much he went and built a statue of himself. Daniel reinterprets that vision from heaven's perspective. It's not metal, it's not beauty, it's not glory, it's a beast that devours one another. So from a human perspective, it's glorious, but from a supernatural perspective, it's destructive. But it's a lamb, so our method matters. Because we say, once, I'll believe it when I see it, or what I see, but we adopt this idea that what we see determines what we hear, but that's not God's method, my friends. God's method is what you hear will determine what you're actually seeing. He saw a lamb, but its nature was revealed not by what he saw, but by what he what? Heard. It spoke like a dragon. And he's like, oh, that's who you really are. That's really your nature, is you're a dragon. And my friends here in America, in Texas, come on, we, God save Texas. We love Texas. I love Texas. It's awesome. I love California. It's also awesome. Kind of crazy, but awesome. Maybe we are listening to things we think are the lamb, but it's actually a dragon. And we wonder why we're not overcoming the way Jesus said we would. We're not conquering the way Jesus said we would. Why? Because maybe we're listening to a dragon. When he sees the lamb, it's a divine parody Just as the first beast mocked his resurrection, this one mocks his sacrifice. He says, I'm a lamb. Got two horns. The lamb in heaven had seven horns. That's pretty cool. Seven's better than two in your face. (laughs) Seven is complete, perfect. A horn is power. The lamb in heaven had perfect, complete power. Seven eyes. He can see all things. It's by the seven spirits. The Holy Spirit has been sent. The perfect spirit of God. But this lamb has two horns. That means he does have power. He does have a limited power, a limited authority, yet it's not quite as good as the one in heaven. But he will make you think that it is. What is this beast's job? It's to make it difficult to distinguish that which is good and that which is evil. It is to bring obscurity to morality. It is to bring a cloudedness to things that God has said is clear. He wants us to be confused. He wants our discernment to be dulled. We need to have ears to hear. So what are some things that could be dragon talk? I don't know. Let's look at it. Maybe it's that we trust more in the government than we do the king. Maybe we think that the change that's going to happen in our nation and in our city is based on an elected official. Come on. Now, I'm, I, I am all for voting. I'm all for participating, and we should. But our trust is not in the government to fix our problems. Our trust is in the king who already paid for our problems. So maybe, just maybe, maybe, just maybe, whether we're on the right or on the left, maybe we are listening to Dragon Talk, thinking that it's our candidate that's going to bring in the kingdom. When all reality, my friends, it is the church that is going to bring in the kingdom of God to this world. It is you and it is I. There's nobody else. But maybe we're trusting in the government more than we trust in the king because we've been listening to a dragon. Maybe, maybe we've been listening to the dragon when we invest more in our portfolio than we do in the kingdom. Come on. Oh, that one went like, I got like one, that's good. That's the guy who doesn't have a 401k. He's <laughs> like, what's an IRA? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not saying don't invest, but do we spend more time penny pinching for our investment and our retirement than we do actually sending the money ahead of us by investing into the kingdom. Maybe we've just listened to a dragon that that's what gives us value, that's what gives us worth. Or how about our, uh, maybe, maybe we think what makes us smart is we actually care more about our education than we do about having a revelation. Now I'm not saying don't have an education. My God, I run a Bible school. You should be having an education, but an education without revelation will die with you. 
Maybe we're listening to the dragon. Maybe we're listening to the dragon because we spend more time building our own house than we do the house of God. We're about to be doing a giving project here. We should be building the house of God. Why? There's more people that needs to be saved in Austin. If they can't get saved in California, they think they're escaping God. No, they're coming here to get saved. They just don't know it yet. Maybe we're listening to the dragon because we would rather live a life of tolerance than repentance. Like, look, tolerance is actually the opposite of repentance. That doesn't mean that we're not kind, we're not accepting, we're not loving. That's not what we're talking about here. But what I am saying is we are more willing to tolerate sin than repent from it. Let's not even speak on a cultural level. Let's speak on a personal level. We will call for repentance for anybody else, but we tolerate our own sin. What is, the, what is the nature of this lamb? To blur and bring obscurity to morality. I don't want to tolerate sin. I want to repent from it. But maybe we're listening to the dragon because we live a life of tolerance rather than repentance. Don't worry, it'll get better. We live more for the opinions of man than we do for the approval of God. That's dragon talk. We would rather be liked by man than we would be to do what the Lamb is asking us to do by laying down our lives. The scheme is simple. It's to get us to worship creation rather than the creator. It's to settle for the almost ultimate rather than the ultimate. 666, right? No one, you know, the crazy number. Mark of the Beast, 666, what is that? It's those who have chosen to settle for that which is almost perfect. That's what 666 is. It's almost there. God created humans and he did a good job. He said so himself. But we are not God. Seven is the number of perfection and completion and it's a picture of God. So 666 is just you're almost there. And the enemy wants to get us to settle for that which is almost ultimate rather than the ultimate. He wants us to settle for the life on earth only. And it's almost there. What about the Tower of Babel? What did they do when they got together? They built the almost reaching heaven. Guys, if our eschatology involves us just bringing peace on earth apart from God, it may not be the right eschatology because heaven is not heaven without Jesus. It's hell. So life away from God is not, why do we think when we get to the end of our life, if we spent our whole life living for the almost, we're going to be comfortable in the real we may be pretty uncomfortable in heaven because our whole life was ex- the expectation that every promise would be filled in the almost ultimate, rather the hope of the ultimate. Yeah. He will wipe away every tear from the eye. Yeah. Sickness will be no more. Shame will be no more. He, there will be a full restoration of all things and healing of all things. Why? Because that's who our God is. Don't settle for the almost ultimate when the ultimate's coming. The keys can come on up. I'm finishing. So how do we overcome? How do we overcome? Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 and 11 says this. And I heard a loud voice in heaven. Remember what John says, what you hear, what you hear, what you hear will interpret what you see. What you hear, what do you hear? I hear a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of God and authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony for they loved not their lives unto death. The picture here is the key of how we overcome. 
Christ's sinless sacrifice as he ascended into heaven. The accuser of the brethren was cast down because of Christ and his victory. We don't have to listen to the dragon anymore. We don't have to listen to the accusations he's throwing our way. The Son of God went from heaven to earth, took on human flesh and bone, lived a human experience, and he was raised, as, as he died, and he, he, he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. He didn't just bring his physical form into the Trinity. He also brought your human experience. One of the biggest lies the dragon will tell you that it's your feel, what you feel is really what's true. That is not true. I cried when we beat Ole Miss because I felt it. But that doesn't mean I should have cried for a football game. But let's take it down. We bring our experiences. Well, you can't speak to that because you've never experienced it. Uh, yeah, Christ has the authority to speak to everything. He said he experienced everything in Hebrews. And guess what? He doesn't just bring the scars of his physical form, but he brings his experience. And he's compassionate towards you. And he says you can reach out for mercy in your time of need. Why? Because the victory he brought. Why should I listen to the lamb? Because it's only the lamb who went from heaven to earth, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. It's only the lamb. So I'm not going to listen to the accusation of the one who was cast down because of the victory of the lamb. Why was the accuser allowed in heaven before him? Because he had something to accuse us of. Because all have fallen short of the sin and the glory of God. We all have, we all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So he had something to accuse you of. So he would say to God, well, look at them, look at this, and look at that, look at this. They're not so perfect. But when Christ came into heaven, he tried to accuse him. But there was nothing to accuse him of. And he is perfect, and he is sinless, and he is righteous. So he was cast down. So now, when the dragon tries to throw accusations your way and deception your way, you don't have to listen to him anymore. You've got the Son of God and His righteousness with you in the inside of you. And it's been imputed into you by grace through faith. And now when He accuses us, we can listen to the Lamb, not the dragon. And I'm willing to lay my life down because the dragon didn't lay down his life for me. The Lamb did. The lamb says you are free. The lamb says you are forgiven. The lamb says you are whole. The lamb says you can endure. The lamb says he can bring healing to your life, healing to your family, healing to your marriage. The lamb says I have experienced it. I have, I have paid it all. You don't need somebody to affirm what happened to you and to experience what happened to you because they can't pay the price. That's the problem. We want everyone to know how we feel. Guess what? That's not going to happen. Because I can't feel what you feel, and you can't feel what I feel, but you know who can? The Lamb. And he's so compassionate that you can come into the Holy of Holies with confidence. I'm not afraid to approach God. Because it's not because of me, it's because of the lamb. And I can grab onto the feet of the Father and say, I have mercy on me. God, I need you. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. It's simple, it's simple as this. And it's not just telling your story. That's not what he's talking about, which is good. Tell your story. But in, when he's saying the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, he's saying, okay, I'm saved because of his blood and his sacrifice, and now I'm agreeing with what the lamb says. That's my testimony. I agree with God. I agree with God. I agree with God when I don't understand, when it doesn't make sense, when it's frustrating, I agree with God. I agree with God with what he says about my sin. I agree with God with what he says about my children. I agree with God with what he says about my marriage. I agree with God with what he says about the church. Oh, hello. 
please don't come up to me and say, Jake, I love you, but I hate your wife. You know what I'm going to tell you? You hate me too. But we do this all the time. Jesus, I love you. It's you and me, baby, to the end. But I don't, I hate the church. Uh Uh-uh, that's his bride. Doesn't work that way. I agree with what God says about the church. He is perfect. People are not perfect. But his bride, this is his bride. This is his bride. We're not building our portfolios. We're not building our individual lives in the kingdom. If you have social anxiety around believers, you are, will be uncomfortable in the new heavens and the new earth. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of believers around you, more than you realize, and you're going to be like, they got saved? <laughs> they got in? Yeah. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Let's stand to our feet this morning. If we could, if we could just close our eyes and lift up our hands, I'm just going to pray for a moment and pray a blessing. Pastor Eric's going to come up. What are some areas that we've agreed with the dragon more than we agree with the lamb? Is it with finances? Is it with family? Is it with your future? Is it with the church? What are some areas that you need to agree with God? So Jesus, I thank you right now that you are an amazing God who came from heaven to earth and took on our sin, our shame, our hurt, our pain, all of it. You experience what we would go through and we can ask for mercy because you're a merciful God. So God, we pray right now, we give it to you. Give us listening ears so we can discern the demonic schemes of the enemy and we will not agree more with him than we do with you. God, we agree with you. We agree with your word. We agree with your scripture. We agree with you. We agree with you and we repent of any area that we have allowed the dragon to form and to shape our worldview. So Lord, I thank you right now. Austin is not going to be the same because this church is going to have a listening ear. Victory City Church is going to listen to discern what the Spirit is doing in our schools, in our culture, in our workplaces, our marketplace men and and women. There's going to be businesses that begin to boom. People are going to be saved in office meetings, in cubicles. People are going to experience the Spirit of God because we're going to have listening ears to hear what the Spirit is saying so we can overcome into the end. Jesus, we thank you. We honor you. We praise you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he lift his countenance towards you. Be gracious unto you and give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hey, if you made it this far, hopefully the message encouraged you. Hopefully it built your faith and we would love to hear about it. We'd love to hear your testimony and your story. Would you consider sending us an email and letting us know how God is moving in your life? You can email us at info at victorycity.church. Also, this is able to happen because of so many people who financially support Victory City Church. If God is leading you to do that, please consider going to victorycity.church forward slash give and any financial contribution that you make would definitely help us uh, continue in our mission to help every person take a step closer to Jesus. And finally, last thing, and then you can turn off, is this. We don't view these things as the church. We view it as a supplement to regular local church attendance. If you need help finding uh, a local church to be a part of, email us at info at victorycity.church and we would love to help you.